welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. All righty, everybody, welcome back to the Asset Revolution podcast. I am excited for today's conversation. Uh, we have someone who I've actually admired from afar for quite some time. Uh, his name is Keith Black. So Keith, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Mark. Great to be with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned before, it's I, I've tried to, you know, really get you on this podcast for a while and, uh, you know, things just didn't sync up and, you know, we met at a a dinner in, at Consensus in Austin uh, a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago now, um, where we had a really cool conversation, enjoyed breaking some bread together, which was really fun. Um, but today, you and I are going to dive in on some really cool topics, and one that I think is top of mind, which is valuation analysis and modeling. And you've done a lot of great work in those areas. And I know that an article for me and what we've done at Arbor Digital has really helped us shape how we value and how we you know, even just approach valuing crypto or digital assets or in the different types of uh, assets that we can get into. Um, and that, that article, I think, was late last year, November 2021. And that was for the CAIA, a C-A-I-A, for those listening. And you know, we did an episode with uh, Michelle Noyes before. Uh, so go back and listen to that if you want more information on them. Um, but before we get into all of that, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us you know, your crypto origin story. Oh, my crypto origin story. I, I think it's probably about 25 years of FOMO. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, kind of academically trained in, in finance, so I understand, uh, you know, value stocks and all of this. And so this, uh, these dot coms in the, in the late 90s, I was watching everyone else trade them and I was kind of sitting on the sideline. And, uh, you know, for the last 20 years, I'm thinking like I could have made so much money and you know, maybe I would have been that, uh, one of the people to sell early. Uh, but uh, crypto kind of seems like the second coming of, of dot coms in, in a lot of ways. And so I kind of missed that, that first round, you know, uh, in the late 90s, 25 years ago. Uh, but now I'm thinking like, well, if crypto is kind of like dot coms, you know, now's my chance to, uh, to get in. Uh, so I bought some, uh, some coins starting in 2019 and 2020, still up since inception, which is nice and uh, lear learned a lot of, uh, along the way. Oh my gosh, and we're gonna, I would love to dive in a little more on that learning journey. But first, how about before you got into crypto now, now that we know your kind of origin story with crypto, you know, you mentioned this academic uh, focused uh, in traditional finance. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What's your background? Where did you grow up in? What kind of shaped how you view things? Uh, so uh, I've, I have a background in uh, commodity derivatives and equity derivatives. I was 20 years in Chicago. I had the, the colorful jacket and the hand signals uh, trading options on the, <laughs> on the exchange floor. Uh, and so I, I understand a lot about the, the, the equity business and the commodity business, and that kind of led into hedge funds. And so I worked for uh, some very large institutional investors uh, working on their, on their hedge fund and derivative strategies for, uh, for pensions and endowments. Uh, and along the way, I got uh, uh, an MBA from Carnegie Mellon and then a, uh, a PhD in management science and finance. And so I, I do have that, mm -hmm. that academic background. I've taught uh, at, at university for uh, probably 13 years now. Uh, so I've taught uh, both traditional and alternative investments. So I've taught hedge funds and private equity. I've taught uh, equities and, and mutual funds, currency markets and, and economics. And as of as of last year, I'm now teaching an undergraduate uh, business course in cryptocurrencies. Wow. So this is kind of a melding between two very different areas, the academic and the practical, uh, when you're actually practicing in the field, and then you have this academic approach as well. So I think we're going to have a really fascinating conversation. So let's go back to that learning journey then. So tell us a little bit about the why. Why make this leap? Why is it worth it? Uh, so I spent 12 years at uh, at Chi Association, and I was uh, working on the on the curriculum and exams. And so my job 
was to, to stay a, a step ahead of the world on, on alternative investments. And, and so I'm always studying the, the new, new thing, right? And if, uh, if an asset class or strategy gets to, you know, half a trillion or a trillion dollars in, in assets, I need to, to be able to explain that to the, to the world. And so I ended up uh, studying uh, digital assets, cryptocurrencies starting in, uh, in 2018 or so. And now it's in the, the Kaya curriculum at level two as well as in the, the financial data professional curriculum. Very interesting. I'm currently going through level one right now and sitting in September. So I, I, at least now I know I won't see it uh, on that level yet uh, until I get to level two. Um, so let's now go into one of the, some of that work and some of what you've done and brought to the Kaya uh, I mentioned was this valuation modeling and analysis. So I'd love to dip, uh, dive into that with you a little bit. So can you give us a high level overview what is, what is, how do you even value these things? How did you even think about approaching it? Right. So the, the, the long form uh, written pieces are out on, on uh, Kaya.org. Uh, and then there's some, uh, there's some videos under the webinars. And then the, the papers are published uh, with Investments in Wealth Institute and the Investments in Wealth uh, Monitor. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the first paper is just, you know, what is, what is crypto? So we look at uh, proof of work, proof of stake, Bitcoin, Ethereum, smart contracts, stablecoins, CBDCs, and then all of the, the risk with crypto. So just kind of setting the space for uh, what's going on broadly. Uh, and then my new paper coming out in, in July, August of, of 22, any day now, uh, is on this, uh, this crypto valuation and, and due diligence. Well, so there's a lot of these materials. So take us through then uh, maybe one of those pieces, um, high level. So what are some of the valuation models that you've come up with after going through all of this data and research? So, you know, we started with this idea that, uh, you know, maybe I'm in crypto because I had FOMO of the, the dot-com stocks 25 years ago. But the more you think about that analogy, the, the more they are pretty similar, right? So 25 years ago, we had what we're now calling Web2. And now we have, you know, what we're calling Web3. And so maybe we need to uh, not, not get so excited about, about crypto and the technology, but take a step back. Think about a, a venture capitalist view or think about a, a centralized finance or a C5 view of, of how this all works. And, and so uh, what happened in, in the dot coms? We saw, uh, you know, the NASDAQ increase by 500 percent in, in just three years. And then uh, between March and November of 2000, it came crashing down to the order of $1.7 trillion. And uh, there's a lot of IPOs, there's a lot of speculation and a lot of upside moves in these stocks. But at the end of the day, uh, Web2 didn't take over the world, at least to the extent we anticipated. And the majority of those dot-coms uh, went, went bankrupt. But the good news is that uh, you know Amazon.com uh, at the beginning of this year was worth more than the $1.7 trillion drawdown we had in NASDAQ uh, in the year 2000. And in addition to that, we've got uh, Priceline and Broadcom and, and eBay and so on. And so in the, in the long run, we're going to see probably 80 plus percent of today's cryptos go to zero, right? So that's the mm -hmm. bad news, right? And that, that kind of aligns with what happened with the, with the dot coms. But the good news is that, that if you pick the, the, the right tokens or the right protocols, uh, some of them could be worth on the order of uh, Apple or Amazon or Google in the long run. And so uh, we need to um, you know, first do uh, a very quick uh, sanity check, right? So I like to say that uh, Doge and Shibu Inu are like pets.com, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the majority of today's cryptos are going to zero, right? And so you need to say, um, what's their what's their user base? What business are they in? Mm -hmm. uh, what's their what's their trading volume? Uh, who's their team, and what's what's being developed? And if you can't tell me what business they're in, right? They're they're not going to have a long run value. And so uh, you could probably uh, eliminate you know most of most of the the the, uh, the ideas or the protocols in in just ten minutes, right? And so if you can't uh, explain what business they're in then you don't even want to take the time to progress toward the, the valuation step. A couple important things that you just highlighted was this, the ideas and comparing kind of the, the history and zooming out a little bit of what we've experienced in investing. And, you know, for me, I, I wasn't 
in the markets. And so for me, it's been a really interesting learning journey during the 2000s or the late 90s for the first interview. group. So I don't have that FOMO like you do, uh, but maybe that's a good thing. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to hear your perspective on that and then to make those uh, analogies between what we saw then and what was experienced over that time period and then seeing what we're going through now. Um, so let's kind of dive in now into, now we've, we've got that backdrop. Take us through some of these valuation models because I think you've, you've highlighted maybe six or seven, maybe we focus on three. So if there's one where you'd start, how do, which valuation model did you start with? Well, I, I think the most important thing is uh, comparing them to a, to a real world business, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need to understand their, their business model. Uh, so what business are they in? Is there, is there some kind of real world comparable? So if you say, you know, how would a, how would a venture capitalist value this, right? They look at the, they look at the team, they look at the strategy, they, they look at the, the progress in building the, the product or the service, and then they'll say, what's the total addressable market, right? How big could this business get? And so the first thing you need to do is look at what industry they're in. And so you know that something like XRP or Bitcoin, that's in, in um, you know, payments and currency, right? And mm -hmm. you, then you've got Solana and Ethereum. Uh, those are the basis for these, these smart contracts, right? Then you've got, uh, you know, completely new businesses like gaming and the metaverse, you know, maybe there's not necessarily a real world component to that. Certainly there's the, the stable coin business. And then there's some, some things like uh, Filecoin or basic attention token, they compete with, you know, real world businesses like, uh, like Amazon or, or Google. So the first thing you need to do is, is understand what business are they in? What's the size of the total addressable market? And then who are they competing with? And so uh, if you look at the, at the DeFi space, right? If you look at something like, a, like an Aave or a Compound, are they competing with somebody like, uh, like a JP Morgan, right? And so you wanna look at, you know, what's the value of you know, the, the CME group, you know, where, where they trade the, the futures and, and options? You know, what's the value mm -hmm. of, of JP Morgan, right? So is there a, a DeFi protocol out there they could take a, a big share of, of, of securities trading or crypto trading or borrowing and lending. Because at the, at the end of the day, we could compare cryptos to these, to these real world businesses. And what's, what's amazing is how small crypto is today, right? If we look at you know, the value of, of, of Ether and the entire DeFi space, it's smaller than the value of JP Morgan. If we look at the entire crypto space, it's smaller than the value of, of Amazon or, uh, or Google or Apple, right? And so if you fit the entire crypto space into one stock, you, you see what the, what the upside might, might be. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think, uh, so some things that contribute to what that upside could be is that these are global open source uh, networks as opposed to being these closed private networks. And I think there'll be a combination of both of those types of networks when we get to wherever we're going in this space. Um, but it's hard to account, you know, JP Morgan, you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, how do you then start thinking about comparing the value of that to some of these DeFi protocols, like you mentioned, Aave uh, and Compound and full disclosure, we do have positions in those within our uh, Compass portfolio at Arbor Digital. Um, but so how do you start, when you start then taking into account the global aspects, does that change how you model this out? Well, I mean, revenues are revenue, right? And total value locked is total value locked, right? And so, uh, you know, certainly these are these are all all global in nature. But I, I think that that a lot of these comparables are as well, right? If you're looking at, you know, Amazon or Apple or, or J.P. Morgan, those are those are global as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about revenue, fees, cost. Can we maybe start start with Bitcoin and then we can move on to Ethereum? How do you start measuring and analyzing that? Uh, one thing that's exciting about crypto is the data that's available, right? And everything's on chain, everything's open source, and there's uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. And so you can you can look at uh, you know CoinDesk and CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap and Token Terminal and Masari, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great uh, information out there. And I, I think for a long time, some people said, oh, this is magical internet money, and it's all going to zero, and it's not worth anything. But again, put on your put on your CFI hat, right? And and kind of put all the all the superlatives and all the the technology aside. We see that that Ethereum had eight billion dollars of of income uh, that was paid either in either in fees or block rewards over the trailing twelve months. Bitcoin's on the order of five hundred million. 
if you add Uniswap, SushiSwap, and Compound together, they had a billion dollars in, in revenue last year between the miners and the stakers and the liquidity providers and the whole community. And so if, um, you know, Ether has, you know, $8 billion in revenue and, and you know, these, these DeFi's have a billion dollars in revenue, uh, Bitcoin's paying out, you know, 500 million a year in, in block rewards, uh, those are real businesses. And what, what's exciting is, uh, you know, some of these are trading at a price to sales of less than eight times, right? And so if you look at the, the FANG stocks, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and, and Google, those are trading between three and seven times revenues. And a lot of these, uh, especially the DeFi protocols and the, and the decentralized exchanges, those are trading at, you know, three to eight times revenues. And so it, it, it's looking like they, they have, you know, a, a similar uh, uh, valuation as some of these top tech stocks. But of course, they're much smaller in, in market cap and their, their trailing revenue growth is, is much bigger than the FANG stocks as well. So using these, you know, price to revenue, price to sales ratios, you can actually start cooking up, you know, what might be a, a fair value for, for these. Is that what you're saying? That, that's right. And, and it, it helps to have some, some context as to what, uh, what a fair, uh, you know, price to revenue multiple is, right? And maybe you want to compare them to, you know, large cap tech stocks, small cap tech stocks, but you want to look at the, at the growth rate as, as well. Very well put. And that's where it's, I think people struggle putting their minds around that because these aren't equities. These are very, very different. So how can you do that comparison? So I'd like to kind of move into uh, another way that you have built some valuation models around this. So I'd like to kind of talk about discounted cash flows then on staking yields. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How did you approach that? Uh, so you have the ability to, to earn a yield uh, by, by lending or staking your, your crypto assets. And some of these are, are proof of stake. And in a, in a proof of stake uh, uh, protocol- uh, Like Ethereum. Like, it's going to. Of, uh, uh, Ethereum will, will eventually be uh, uh, proof of stake, right? But you've got uh, you know, Cardano and then uh, you know, Avalanche, Solana kind of in, in the proof of stake. And, and the, more, the more tokens you, you own, the, the more you participate in the, in the validation of the, of the blocks. And so what, what's happening is we're, we're building this, this uh, global distributed ledger and you need uh, computers around the world to secure that. What they're gonna do is they're going to store all of the data, they're gonna store all of the, the ownership and the, and the data that, that comes out of these, uh, these uh, protocols. And they're going to secure it as well using cryptography, which is where crypto comes from. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the miners and the validators are getting paid to provide the service. And on Bitcoin uh, and proof of work networks, it's very competitive, right? So there's thousands of people around the world. And every 10 minutes, just one of them gets paid for, uh, for securing the network. But in a, in a proof of stake, it's not necessarily competitive. Uh, it's simply based on uh, the economics you've contributed to that protocol. So you might earn, um, you know, one percent of the block rewards if you control one percent of the stake tokens. So it sounds like you can start applying, you know, some fundamental discounted cash flow models towards something like that and proof of stake. That, that, that's right. And so uh, not only is there is there proof of stake, but there's also a, a borrowing and lending market. And so people have a a demand to, to borrow cryptocurrencies for, for a number of different reasons. Uh, maybe they're, they're deferring their taxes, maybe they're, they're levering up, maybe they wanna take a short position. And so depending on what, what exchange you're on, and I'm on a number of, uh, of centralized exchanges and they all offer their own um, uh, yield protocol. And mm -hmm. so uh, you, know, you, you might get uh, yield on you know, Bitcoin or ETH at, uh, at 3%. You know your stable coins might be you know five to nine percent, uh, and then your your other tokens might be you know one percent to, to six percent. And so these are these are paid in annual pick yields, right? Paid in kind. And so you're not getting like a like a dollar cash dividend. You're simply uh, earning earning more tokens. And so if you're if you're uh, lending ETH at uh, at a three percent annual rate, and you start off with with uh, you know ten ETH you'd have 10.3 ETH at the end of the year, right? So there's no guarantee what it's going to be worth. You just have 
you know, 3% more, more tokens at the, at the end of the year. But, uh, you know, we know that the key to valuing stocks is, uh, say, a dividend discount model. And if you, uh, if you want to think about the, the staking yields and lending yields in, in crypto, again, uh, you know, these are, these are worth more than zero, right? Because they're, they're paying out these, uh, these, real, uh, these real staking yields or these, these real lending yields. Uh, and you could, you could uh, figure out what those might be worth to you. But of course, you need to figure out, um, you know, the dividend discount model is, is next year's cash flow divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. And every, every investor is going to have their own discount rate based on how risky you think this is. Uh, and then, you know, what, what's the growth rate in, in yields, right? Some people want the growth rate in yields to be negative, right, rather than going from a, an inflationary uh, protocol to a deflationary protocol. So I, I know that there's a lot of people who are going to be listening to this. And this is something I asked myself, too, is like, you know, the output's only as good as the input. So how do you approach those rates that go into all of this math that we do on, in the traditional world and then apply it here? Well, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily coming up with a, with a point estimate of, of, what, of what, every, what every crypto is worth. You know, when I start talking about this, people are like, send me the spreadsheet. It's like, no, 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 there's, there's not a spreadsheet for this, right? It's, it's kind of a conceptual way of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. But whether you look at um, you know the the revenue that's that's going through these protocols, or whether you look at the at the staking yields, uh, you know price to sales, price to earnings, all of these different ways, we're we're triangulating on an idea that the crypto space is is worth a lot more than than zero, mm -hmm. and uh, you know hopefully most of the world is beyond beyond that. Uh, and so if you take these you know top fifty tokens, say. Um, you know, hopefully the majority of them are going to be around in five or 10 years and, mm -hmm. and have uh, a pretty significant business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, one of the major pieces of data that we are always paying attention to, and I think one of the inputs that is so important is, you know, volume, transactions, uh, you know, to, to help understand, you know, the velocity of the markets. Can you talk a little bit about like what you feel measures those things ac accurately? But what's super interesting is uh, ETH traded at, at about $1,000 and Bitcoin traded at, at about $20,000 at the end of 2017, mm -hmm. at the end of 2020, and now in, in June and July of 2022. And, and so the market keeps coming back to this $1,000 in ETH and this, this $20,000 in, in Bitcoin. But there's this idea of Metcalf's law. Right. And, and Metcalf's law says the value of any network, whether it's a social network, whether it's telephones or whether it's a, a, a crypto protocol, the value of any network is is based on the square of the number of participants. And so, you know, again, we're 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 not going to put like a dollar estimate on this, but we're we're always looking at relative value. Is it worth more than this or less than this? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so maybe when when. Um, you know, Ether got to $1,000 and, and Bitcoin got to $20,000 at the end of 2017, I think they were probably a little bit ahead of themselves. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the, when the ICOs uh, kind, of, kind of slowed down, uh, there, there's a lot of downside uh, in, in that one. Um, but what's interesting today is that the number of wallets in Bitcoin today is worth five, uh, there's five times the number of wallets today as there was at the end of 2017. And so if you believe in, in Metcalf's law, which was, which was pretty useful, say, from 2012 to 2017, if you believe in Metcalf's law, Bitcoin today might be worth you know, 25 times what it was worth at the end of 2017, right? And I'm not saying that it's worth you know, 25 times you know, 20,000. Maybe it was overvalued at, at the end. But if we keep coming back to this same price level, if there's more users, if there's more total value lock, if there's more press coverage, if there's uh, you know uh, more development activity, if there's uh, it, you know an increase in the in the community, all of mm -hmm. these are pointing toward higher levels of, of valuation. And so the 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 shorthand uh, answer is that ETH at a thousand dollars or, or fifteen hundred dollars today is worth way more than the than the thousand dollar ETH at the end of 2017. And I think the twenty thousand dollar Bitcoin today is worth a lot more than than the twenty thousand dollar Bitcoin at the end of twenty seventeen. That's a really interesting perspective, and this is exactly what we hope to bring out on on our show like this. 
um, it's so important to, to realize that like a lot of these methods, you know, we're really just trying to get into, you know, what we call these reasonable ranges for, you know, where the price should or could be. And, and you know, try to identify some of these assumptions, you know, with these rates that we've mentioned so far. And then, you know, we have to make certain estimates. And right now it's all, we're all just trying to figure it out. And that's the, it's also, it's good and bad. It's good because, you know, the standards aren't set yet. So that means it's just fair game for everyone to come in to do the work and figure out what the standards are gonna be uh, when we all get to that. And, you know, we're probably gonna be taking a, a new designation course or all these other designation courses are gonna have all of these new standards built into, you know, alternative asset investing or, you know, digital asset specific investing. Um, so it's but just- what's, really what, But what's interesting, Mark, is maybe there's nothing new about this, right? Maybe, uh, and, and I think one of the big downfalls of the, of the dot-coms 25 years ago is we started making up all these new, all these new um, ideas, right? And mm -hmm. one of them was like price to eyeballs and, you know, all these, all these new web two protocols, they give you a bunch of free stuff, right? And yep. then they give you all this free stuff. And then they're like, oh, we have X thousand users and our company's worth this because we have X thousand users. But if you stop giving away free stuff, those users aren't going to come back, right? Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't based on, on revenue, right? And, and what, what I'm trying to get to in, in all, of these, all of these models is the idea that what if we use standard valuation models? Right. What if we're not like YOLO trading 100 times levered and you know, <laughs> saying, you know, Bitcoin to a million dollars tomorrow? What if we take this, this super long term perspective, look at, you know, tried and true metrics, not make anything up, you know, uh, simply to fit the, the crypto story, but say, you know, in a, in a world where we're growing a new business. Right. What would an, uh, a public equity investor pay for this or what would a, a venture capital investor pay for this? Because that's how you're going to. Uh, get get value in the long run. You're not going to get value in the long the long run from from speculation and from you know making making up stories to to you know justify something that's clearly overvalued, right? Well, and so and I'm sorry to interrupt right here, but this is where uh, I think what's different and what's kind of revolutionary about this is, and I think you've and I've heard you say this is that uh, open source decentralized blockchains right now is like publicly traded private equity, right? Um, That's right. Right. Yeah. I love that line. And I totally agree. Um, so normally when you're trying to find, you know, what would you pay for when uh, these companies are in that private equity stage? That's normally done through uh, appraisals, right? There is no market to, to tell you what the price should, should or could be at. So that's where it's, this is a little different where it could be revolutionary. I guess that's kind of what I think about. Right. Because a venture capitalist might say, I'm going to pay, uh, you know, 20 times uh, 2024 earnings, right? And I, I simply uh, forecast the, the earnings go forward, uh, you know, put, put some, um, uh, some multiple on that. And that's what I'm trying to get to. So you have a long-term estimate of revenue. You have a long-term estimate of, of earnings. You put some, some forward multiple on that. And that's based on, you know, the, the size that that company could be. But there's, a, there's an important caveat here, right? The important caveat is that when a venture capitalist makes an investment, they're, they're making a commitment to stay with it for five years, right? Mm -hmm. They wanna be a long-term investor. They want that company to grow you know, 5X, 10X, 20X, and then they wanna sell it five years from now. And they're looking to make you know, uh, two or three times their money over a, uh, over a five to 10 year period. And so the, the traditional venture cap model has a super long-term holding period and we're not, uh, we're not changing the value on a minute by minute basis. We might change the value once a year based on the next round of funding or you know, what our, our revenues or, or earnings are. And so mm -hmm. what's, what's super interesting about the, about the crypto space, if this is publicly traded venture capital, uh, you know, a lot of these are gonna go to zero. You know, some of them are gonna go to you know, uh, you know, billions of dollars, but um, we don't have the patience to, to stick with this, right? And so, some people might um, might say, "Oh, I made you know X times my money on on one protocol, and uh, I ended up selling it. I held it for three months. I made five times my money, and then they'll look back on it like, oh, five years later, you could have made 50 X, right?" And so the 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 minute to minute nature of of crypto makes it easy to sell, but when you're in the traditional venture cap market, you you have a much longer uh, time horizon. Yeah, and I think what we get here is the usually 
when these companies at these earliest stages don't have to deal with the behavioral side of retail investors. And that's a whole new wrench to throw in as well. And that's where, you know, treasury management for these, you know, decentralized blockchains becomes even more important. Um, but do you, do you see anything else that is, I guess, amplified or unique to, to digital assets or crypto? I, I think, um, you, you know, you asked what my pet peeve about crypto is. Uh, oh, that's not, that's not going to be till later. Don't spoil us. But you oh, can don't go ahead. spoil it. <laughs> oh, go ahead. What's your pet peeve in crypto? My my pet peeve in crypto is people trading at you know ten times leverage or a hundred times leverage. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and so if you're if you're trading at a hundred times leverage, um, if the market goes down one percent, you lose everything you put in, and if the market goes up one percent, uh, you doubled your money. And, and ETH is up like 50% in three weeks, right? And so if you're trading at 100 times leverage, you know, you're, you're either going to get stopped out or, or make, make a home run like in, in 20 minutes or 20 hours, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're seeing that, that this leverage is kind of exacerbating the moves. And so, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ether have five times the volatility of a stock market index. And, and part of that is, is this, this lever nature, because when we're in, you know, private equity and venture capital, we might be levered at, at two times, right? If you're in mm -hmm. public equity, you could lever at two times. If you're trading, you know, oil or gold or, or Bitcoin futures at, at CME, you might be levered four times, right? But we see in crypto, you have the ability to lever, you know, 10 times or 100 times if you're outside the US. And that, that um, you know, exacerbates this, this volatility. And that kind of forces this, this short-term thinking not only on the highly levered players, but on the rest of us, right? Because the rest of us have to deal with kind of the, the volatility to the upside and the downside that comes from these levered players. I mean, well said, we're experiencing that. We've experienced that over the last few months. And again, normally you wouldn't have to go through these types of behaviors as early as we're experiencing them, should we be in a, a normal traditional, you know, private equity situation. Um, so tell me, tell us a little bit now, we've got these models. I think uh, one thing I'd like to kind of keeping on with the comparison to real assets, is there anything else you'd say in terms of what analogies would you use with people who are asking you about how to value these? What other um, real world comparisons would you help people make? So, so again, go, go back to these, these dot-com stocks, right? So I said the, the dot-com survivors are, are Amazon and Priceline and eBay and Broadcom. Right, and you say, oh, those are all big Web two companies. But if you if you get down to it, uh, you know, eBay is different than Priceline, is different than Amazon, is different than than Broadcom, and you know, most people probably can't name the number five e commerce platform, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in in the venture capital markets and in in the Web two market, it's it's winner take all, right? So not only do you need to understand what industry they're in, what industry they're building, you know, who are they competing with in the total addressable market you have to be convinced that this product, this service, and this team has the ability to be you know, a top three player in this space, right? Because in, in, these, um, in these global markets, right? In, in many cases, you know, it's, it's the top three players have you know, 50, 70, you know, 90 some percent market share. And so while uh, you know, not only do you have to say, is it a good product? Is it a good service? How big is the market? You also have to convince yourself that this is the number one player, the number three player in this space, because the, the number 10 player in, in most of these verticals isn't gonna, gonna reach that level of market cap you'd like it to have. Yeah, and I think another thing to add on to that would be around to understand back in the dot-coms and web two, is a lot of the companies we know and love today, you mentioned the FANG stocks, is a lot of times they actually weren't the first or the biggest at the beginning. They actually came in a little bit later. Is that is that something that you think will also rhyme a little bit as we continue to mature in digital assets? Uh, again, we could steal some thunder from our, our next conversation on, on, on risk. Um, one, of the, one of the things you, you like to see in the, uh, in the traditional world is, is what's called a, a, a competitive advantage or, a, or an edge or a, or a moat. What's the secret you have, right? <laughs> what's the secret you have? What's the barrier to entry? Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, a, a traditional company uh, can have a barrier to entry uh, based on, you know, copyrights and patents and proprietary technology and all of this. And those concepts don't really work in, in crypto. And so uh, you might you might say, 
once once a um, you know given comp company gets to a uh, uh, a given market share or a given revenue in a certain industry, they might be you know uh, much less risky because their their market position is secured and it's going to be hard for people to come in and compete with them either through patents or scale or technology or whatever. But in the crypto space, you don't have that uh, you know margin of safety. You don't have that that idea that that these are going to be uh, you know, in the in the long run. So maybe one of the, the biggest risk in the space is somebody's got a, a good business and a good market share today, but, you know, technical innovation uh, in this space, you know, I don't know if a month is a year or if a day is a month, uh, but the, the world is moving so fast that, that the leader today, there's not necessarily a guarantee that they're going to be a leader in the space uh, in, in the future. And that's, that's probably the, the biggest worry for me. Yeah. And uh, I love it. You're actually giving the teaser then. Um, I was going to end off uh, the episode highlighting, but you're going to get it now, everybody. Uh, this is actually going to be a two-part series where we dive into on our second uh, podcast episode with Keith here. Um, he has graciously uh, allowed us to, to tap into his genius for a second episode around crypto risk um, and kind of how we how he thinks about that. And then on top of that, we can layer in kind of some some of the maybe myths around risk and maybe a, a different way of thinking about it. So we're going to do that on our next podcast, but I'd like to round out this episode uh, with a couple uh, last things. So one is that you have this paper coming out in July of August and you mentioned due diligence. So we've talked about valuation analysis and modeling. Tell us a little, and I think we've hit on a couple of concepts around due diligence, you know, fundamental analysis, VC type approach. Um, is there anything else you'd mention on due diligence that's important? Right, so, so due diligence is looking at what's the product and service that they're, that they're offering, right? And so when, when I talk to my, um, my students, some of, some of whom were internet entrepreneurs in the, in the late 90s, I, I said, you have to build a product or service that people will use, right? Mm -hmm. That they will pay you for, right? That they'll pay you for more than it costs you to build and before anyone else does something similar. Right. And so those are those are pretty high bars. And so you want to look at the quality of the product or service. You want to look at the sustainability of the business model, the total addressable market. Uh, you know, due diligence in crypto is is reading the code, looking at the audits, the smart contract risks, um, you know, looking at the at the team. Uh, you know, uh, when you look at the team, uh, you know, have these people built businesses before. Have they have they programmed major systems before? Uh, you know, and then what's what's unique about crypto is again, a lot of this data is transparent. So how many people are on their Twitter? How many people are on their Discord? How many people are on their Telegram? How many people are on their GitHub? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the total value locked? And so if people are using the protocol, if there's, if there's volume going through it, if there's people uh, who are involved in it and, and passionately following it, uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of value to that. But if you can't figure out what business they're in, if you can't figure out how many users they have, it's gonna be hard, uh, challenging for them to have a uh, real value in the long run. Very well said. And we take a very similar approach. And, and Keith, uh, you've, you've helped us in how we think about approaching investing uh, in this space very much. So I wanna say thank you for all of the work that you do now and the work that you are gonna continue to do. Um, and I think I, the last question I have to go before we get into our quick fire questions here is around Ethereum 2.0 and the merge that's coming up. You know, uh, you mentioned a 50% move in Ethereum and we're recording today on July 20th. It's about 1.45 central time here in Texas. So I'd like maybe to hear your thoughts. Um, what, do you, what do you think about the merge? Do you think the, the transition from proof of work to proof of stake uh, and the monetary policies that are coming with that uh, ETH 2.0 uh, evolution uh, are gonna be good for it in the long run? Um, I would love to just get your thoughts. Well, so there's this um, there's a CFI uh, phrase, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we were talking about the merge happening uh, as early as 2018, right? And now we've set a date, say, you know, September 18, right? And so if September 18 comes and goes uh, without the merge, you know, there might be some some downside in in. So so right now, uh, it's it's a proof of work protocol. Uh, which, which means that uh, the the miners and the validators are, are competing to write those blocks to to the the Ethereum blockchain, and they're uh, they're compensated to to do that. Uh, but it's competitive, and and it's uh, it's a big user of of electricity, 
because you've got thousands of computers competing to solve these uh, these cryptographic puzzles and and uh, write this information to the uh, the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, we've seen that that the the usage of Ethereum there's a there's a limited block size. Uh, there's so there's a maximum number of transactions that can go through Bitcoin. There's a maximum number of transactions that can go through the the Ethereum network, uh, which is much smaller than you'd find in some of these proof of stake, and certainly much smaller than you'd find in, in a real world protocol like uh, a MasterCard or a Visa. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the, the, the proof of, of work is um, uh, heavily energy consuming and that blockchain is, is congested. And so Ether has been between 80 and 100% full for most of the last three years. And so there's, there's a lot of demand, which has driven um, uh, the transaction cost higher uh, which we call gas fees. And the, the more congested it gets, the more expensive it, it is to, uh, to transition uh, to, to write your, your data uh, to the Ethereum blockchain. Now, the, the merge, when we move to, to proof of stake, uh, we're, it's based on the, the economics. And so when you're, when you're in a proof of work protocol, you're compensated for spending money on electricity mm -hmm. and spending money on mining rigs. Right, and uh, the electric companies and the mining rig companies don't help, um, quote unquote, finance or build the the Bitcoin or or the the Ethereum network. Uh, but when you move to proof of stake, it's not your investment in in mining rigs and and electricity bills that pays off. It's your investment in that native token. And so if you're investing in you know Avalanche or Cardano or or Solana, Cosmos. Uh, that, that have proof of stake or modified proof of stake systems, you're actually investing money in that token. So you wanna see that, um, that, that token su succeed. Now, um, one, of the, one of the myths about the merge that, that some people might not, not understand is the merge is not immediately going to increase throughput or reduce gas fees on, on Ether. It's simply moving from that, that competitive proof of work system to the, uh, the proof of stake system where the, the probability of writing a block to the to the Ethereum blockchain is based on the number of, of tokens you you have staked. Now, what what's really transformative for for Ether is um, not what's happening at the merge, but what's happening later called sharding. Uh, in that, when we go from um, uh, serial processing to parallel processing, you know, if uh, you're if you're working on say 16 chains at once, you can uh, you can uh, increase the throughput by say 16 times. And that's re what's really gonna be transformative and putting the, the, the throughput and the um, uh, throughput higher and the gas fees lower. And so hopefully people don't think that, uh, that the merge um, one is guaranteed to happen in September. And when it does happen, it's not immediately going to increase the throughput and reduce the gas fees. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we tend, it's really, nice to hear more of a disciplined approach to other than what you see in headlines or when you see other people talking about, you know, ETH 2.0 is going to save everything. Um, it's going to, there probably is going to be some pain. Uh, no matter what, you never can forget in this space that everything is still an experimentation phase. And especially when Ethereum is built and matured over the last six years, in a certain way, it's now moving over to this completely new system, there are definitely gonna be some pain points no matter what. Um, and I think what we get excited about too is, you know, the, the economics that are gonna change uh, when you go to this proof of stake system. And, you know, if you start thinking, you know, of, of Ethereum more like a commodity um, and it could turn into this productive commodity um, because you can now generate interest by staking it. And you, you've mentioned a few things like that already. Um, I mean, that asset uh, structure like that just doesn't exist right now in, in either world. And so it'd be really cool to, to see how that all plays out. And it's going to take more time, I think, than people realize. But I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that. Um, so I'd like to round out this episode now, just going through some quick fire questions. So these can be answered, you know, either one or a few words or just a one line phrase. So uh, are you are you game, Keith? Let's go. All right, let's do it. So first one. So what is an achievement that you are most proud of outside of work? Uh, I've enjoyed uh, traveling around the world. So I've been to uh, uh, every state and province in Canada, Mexico, and uh, the US. 
as well as about 40 foreign countries. And so there's some, uh, some amazing things to see in the world. And so you should go to New Zealand and see the Hobbit houses. Oh my gosh, uh, I'm a little jealous. And yes, I would love to see the Hobbit houses. Um, great, well, wonderful answer. Uh, so second question, who is a mentor that has an impact on you that you carry with teachings from till today? I think that it, your um, your first boss in a professional capacity is always going to leave uh, leave an imprint on you. And so I was working in uh, in commodity sales and training. Uh, you know, you come out of business school and and you're uh, uh, you're you're trading energy and metals for for corporate customers, and uh, you're working with somebody who's been doing it for years. They show you the ropes, and uh, you know I learned a lot about futures and options, and you know to to this day. You know that's been uh, that's been useful from uh, you know mentor thirty years ago. Wow, very cool. It's it's always interesting to see how much and how long you take you just from those humble beginnings. Um, okay, last one. So since we already went over your pet peeve in crypto, give us your pet peeve in traditional finance. The pet peeve in, in traditional finance. Um, you know, it, it you can't lever up as much in uh, in traditional finance as you as you can in in crypto. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about the 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 Ben Graham school of uh, of investing and the Warren Buffett school of investing. And so when when people are um, you know we could blame it on these these spacs. You know, like the the electric vehicle and the the battery companies. Uh, you know, we have zero revenue today. And we're going to have, you know, 10 billion in three years, right? Which is a faster revenue growth than, than say, Google had, which was the most successful company of all time. And so, uh, you know, people get enamored with these with these growth stories that are so clearly uh, outlandish, and they they kind of let these uh, uh, oppor opportunities uh, squander uh, on the on the value side. Oh my gosh, you and I have similar pet peeves. Uh, the sec sacrificing for growth at all costs is uh, is one of my pet peeves. So I think there's some overlap on that one. Uh, so I resonate with you there. Well, thanks for going through that exercise with me, Keith. That was, uh, that's always, it's always nice for the audience to get to know you a little bit more. Um, so I appreciate you jamming with me. Now we've gone over a lot of stuff, valuation analysis, modeling, we went over due diligence all throughout where, and you mentioned some resources at the beginning. So give the audience, where do they find you? Where can they get to some of your your content and your resources. And I know we have another episode coming, which will have even more resources to share, but give them those ones that we, to start with. Uh, so I'm on, on Kai, I'm on uh, link, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, and then uh, CAIA.org. You can look at the, um, at the blogs and the, and the webinars there. Uh, and then uh, these, these two long form articles, uh, one introducing the crypto space and one on valuation and due diligence. Those are out on uh, investments in Wealth Monitor, July, August of 21, and then July, August of 20. Wonderful. So uh, we will make sure to put all of those links in the show notes, as well as a link to your LinkedIn and to maybe some other resources. But we're not going to spoil everything yet because we got another episode coming at you uh, shortly after this one. So stick around. Uh, wait for that next episode to come out where we're going to talk all about crypto risk. Um, and Keith, thank you again for joining me today. Uh, if you uh, joined us today uh, from wherever you are, make sure to tell somebody today that you care about them and we'll see you on the next episode. Cheers, everybody. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers.
We are financial advisors. However, we are not your financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. If you have individual questions, please reach out.